slides, hopefully. Um, do you want to say who you are first whilst I'm putting up the slides, Tom? Yeah, sure. So um, hello, everyone. It's fantastic to see such a um, big number of you um, uh, dialing in. My name is Tom Smith. I'm a liaison psychiatrist at the RDE. So that means I and my wonderful team of multidisciplinary practitioners um, go into places like the ED and the wards to help out people and staff uh, who might be um, struggling uh, to manage uh, mental health problems. Um, and I, like Rory, am also a PDG tutor and we also organise the psych curriculum. Um, so yeah, lovely to see you all. And I guess it's worth emphasising that for this session to make sense, we need you to be doing lots of interacting primarily through the chat function um, uh, to sort of help get a bit of to and fro. All right, that's me. Who are you, Rory? Thanks, Tom. I think I know who I am. So um, I'm a consultant child psychiatrist. I work um, principally in uh, paediatric liaison. Um, so you'll come across me when you do your, um, your peds visits and your CAM stuff. Um, I um, live in Exeter, I have two kids uh, and I'm very passionate about teaching. So me and Tom share this undergraduate um, role together. Have my slides come up, Tom? Uh, yeah, I can see them. Good. Um, Good. Uh, they're in the kind of um, uh, sort of uh, not full view. So it's you've still okay. got them on the side, but oh, yeah, that, that's perfect. perfect. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So so here we are and we're going to talk to you um, about psychiatry. And the, and the idea of this lecture is that we have fairly early on in your course um, a couple of lectures and I'm doing another one next Friday um, about mental health to put it front and centre, really, I think, um, where it, it didn't used to be. Um, and, and we do this because we're, we're very passionate about mental health. Um, we think it's great. And in, in truth, this is partly also, um, you know, a recruitment drive because I don't know how Tom's experience was at medical school, but psychiatry was often a bit of an afterthought. Um, and what we're hoping to do is, um, is demonstrate to you its importance um, as well as uh, why you might fancy doing it yourselves, really. Yeah. And I mean, just yesterday I was sat here in this room with my friend, the medical director for my trust, and he's newly into the role. And I was saying, you know, how's it going? You're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, not too bad. Um, but the main thing that's concerning me is medical recruitment. Um, and so, you know, if um, the prospect of uh, complex cases, chronic conditions and um, working with people and their families and spending a lot of time homing your clinical communication skills and biopsychosocial formulations, loads of multidisciplinary working. Um, it certainly keeps us very interested as quite seasoned consultants now, and we hope that it will um, interest some of you as well. Um, so that little bit aside, um, what we're keen to kind of present in this uh, uh session will be in tune with stuff you've already started covering in pdg so thinking broadly about psychosocial um contributors to ill health um and um think about just really how common mental health problems are i think we're all more aware of that there's been more talk and indeed incidents and prevalence of it during the covid crisis um, we're going to think a bit, and Rory will discuss some application to cases of the biopsychosocial approach to assessment, not merely thinking about um, uh, the body and anatomy and physiology and such like. Um, uh, and yeah, hopefully at the end of it, you'll see why we enjoy doing our job so much. We've got a couple of videos that we'll try and play during the session, but if that doesn't work, we've got the links and you can watch them and then come back and have some discussion. So we started doing this um, session back in the day when everything was face to face. And um, uh, what we did is we got people to split into two um, and think about what is it, this concept mental illness. Um, so it'd be really helpful if in the chat people came up with some ideas about what does that mean? What might that signify? Is it something about a label? Is it something about symptoms? Um, so yeah, if you just, uh, all of you have a bit of a think and then start putting some um, ideas up in uh, the chat. Um, if, if an alien came to the um, the world and said, oh, I've come across this 
word mental illness what does it mean and let's just have some some thoughts What they, um, they probably don't know, Tom, is how comfortable psychiatrists are with silence. So. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we can wait for a whole 60 minutes, um, although we might get a little internally uncomfortable at about 30 minutes. Um, so I guess maybe to um, uh, get the conversation off, I've got a thing here called the ICD-10 um, classification of mental and behavioural disorders, and I use this a lot to help um, structure thinking. Um, it's full of codes and diagnoses but i'd like to think that mental illness is more than just this and so how might it be more than that i know lots of you have already been um through pdg on um psych placements you've been in gp coming across people with mental health problems um so uh yeah let's let's hear a couple of thoughts about what does it mean mental illness what's it like to have that Oh, absolutely. So we've got Hannah um, commenting. Um, so focusing on the distress that can be associated with mental ill health. Um, so our thoughts and feelings um, might be causing us pain as well as the physical body. And actually, if there was one thing to take away, that is partly why we're interested. It's not merely to give people kind of diagnoses or codes. We're interested because it's distressing and there's pain associated and um, so that's a lot of the focus of our work um yeah absolutely as naya said it's um not just about how people think it is also about how they behave and that's one of the rich parts of psychiatry you know it's a lot about talking to people but also gaining um history from others to um see what objectively is going on um uh, yeah, so again, we've got a focus from Molly talking about changes and distress to thoughts and actions. Um, so it's quite a sort of a rich um, understanding and there's that sort of objective take diagnostic bits, but also that personal effect on the person. Um, and I guess I'm aware, I, I, I know if we ran this for a long time, people would start talking about stigma. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say, well, you know, I've got cancer. Um, which I don't, but if I were to say that, I'd have a huge sort of outpouring of interest and support. But if I put my hand up and said, oh, I have schizophrenia, there would be all kinds of other often negative associations that people might have. Um, so, uh, um, Agung Bate or Bate has emphasised um, how past experience can have an effect. And yeah, traumatic experiences of all colours and kinds, a really important um, way that we seek to understand experience of mental illness. Um, and yeah, absolutely, Jess has um, uh, said a really important thing, deviation from social norms. But part of me, as a sl ever so slightly eccentric person, I quite like to deviate slightly from social norms. For example, I don't have a car, and lots of people see that as a bit weird, um, but I sure as hell hope that no one's seeking to pathologise that. And yet that kind of sense of someone doing something differently, being a bit of an other, can very rapidly become judgment and then all kinds of negative consequences for that person. Um, Tom, uh, Gemma makes a really good point about um, reactions to normal events and mm. in my question I, I've, I've wondered if our students can think about how we measure these problems but uh, part of the reason that we have the ICD-10 is to give us some guidance isn't it about you know how long something might go on for and be considered normal in a response to a psychosocial event and at what point does that become pathology and actually I would argue that there's no difference. So some people would say, well, psychiatry isn't very scientific. But how did we decide what the category for hypertension was? Um, is, al is always my comeback to that. How do we know what a normal range of blood sugars are? Well, what we do is we look statistically at the, the breadth of experiences and we say, well, 
for example, with bereavement, um, that would tend to go on for X period of time and have this degree of impairment. And if it is more than that, we might consider it therefore to be an illness. But I think it's really important to have that uh, central to what we're discussing here, because that is something that might be commonly um, you know, targeted against psychiatry, that what we do doesn't have a particular scientific foundation. And, and we know that's not true, Tom. So uh, mm. I'm just putting that forward. And, and great. So Naya is saying, thank you. There are some self-reported surveys. And uh, the PHQ-9 is a depression um, screening tool. The GAD-7 is an anxiety one. Um, and again, these are scientifically driven um, tools which have been through um, you know, a lot of um, uh, specific measurements to prove that they are um, adequate. And they could be really useful in broad settings. Say one of the things that we're doing in the RD alongside our kind of ward based work is encouraging other specialisms, be it cardiology or gastroenterology, to take more ownership of the huge portion of people coming through their services with often undiagnosed and often medically focused presentations, be it the irritable bowel or the non cardiac chest pain. Um, and using in a supported way, these kind of screening measures can be um, really helpful to pick up people's distress and problems with functioning. Um, so there are all kinds of different definitions that are out there about mental disorders. Um, and as you've been saying in the chat, um, the WHO was talking about that's WHO, abnormal thoughts, emotions and behaviours and examples might be intellectual disability, schizophrenia, depression, problems related to drug abuse, American Psychiatric Association, um, uh, a bit similar, but then excluding substance use disorders and already, you know, two quite august institutions having slightly different nuanced takes on what counts. And I guess, again, it's that question of what treatments do we have available and should those be things, can those be things that can be enforced um, uh, should they be enforced? And what is normal? How much alcohol is normal to drink? Um, when I qualified, the recommended um, weekly intake was 28 units for a man. Now it is 14. So what was right? Um, and the next slide emphasises um, the sort of positive aspects of health, not just illness. Um, uh, so it's something about realising your potential coping with the normal stresses of life, those bits where, you know, you might get temporarily overwhelmed or stressed or worried and you can work productively and fruitfully as defined by yourself. And the reason why there's a picture of a jazz master guitar there is because um, when I'm not looking after my new baby and helping out my wife and putting out the bins or worrying that the bins might get blown away by gale force um, uh, wins, I like to play the guitar. And if I couldn't play the guitar because of my emerging osteoarthritis, that would really affect my well-being and probably my mental health. Well, um, I've asked a question there in, in the in the chat, Tom, about um, what people think. Uh, where where have we got to with defining mental illness? Because um, you know the, the the studies show most recently that, for example, rates of anxiety and depression in young people are increasing. But at the same time, we have a cultural phenomenon, I would argue, of adolescents and young adults um, changing their language about um, mental distress. And actually a common thing that we hear now from lots of people in the, in the media is, oh, it's my mental health, doctor, it's my mental health. Now that's a rather strange thing to say because no one would go to the doctor and say, it's my physical health. But what they mean is, I wonder if I have a mental disorder, or well, maybe what they mean is life is really tough at the minute. Um, and I am distressed. Um, and, you know, we all develop those ways to show people and show ourselves that we're distressed. Um, yeah, does anyone have a take on that? Or maybe that's. And I, and I think the thing is, so, so I work in, in child and adolescent mental health and um, We've seen a, a real explosion of eating disorders in young people um, during the pandemic. And um, part of that uh, potentially is a sort of slightly contagious effect. In fact, um, everyone's familiar with the idea that social media and Instagram and so on might be worsening our collective mental health. Do people have a view 
on that as an idea. You will all be using social media, I have no doubt, and perhaps some of you have had an experience where actually it's been really unhelpful for how you think and feel. Social media, good or bad, that's mm. what you can vote on in the side. <laughs> <laughs> It's not remotely contentious, of course, very cut and dried answers. And 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 that's true because, um, you know, the public sort of consciousness is that mental health is bad. Um, <laughs> uh, social media is bad for young people. But actually, lots of um, colleagues of, of mine would say what gets lost is all of the all of the benefits of interconnectivity. And actually, there's a lot of support out there, um, as John T says, more more complicated, uh, closer to an addiction when it's harmful. And actually, What's happened in the last few years is there has been an opening up of NHS addiction services uh, for people with online addictions. Um, gambling, yes, that sounds very sensible, but also people um, and kids addicted to online gaming. Um, and you might be staggered to find that sometimes when I take a history, uh, a family will say, well, you know, the child's not going to school and he will play eight to 12 hours of video games a day. Of course, the very first question is, why are you as parents not stopping that? Um, but these things can be addictive. Um, this is where I'm not going to reveal how many hours my Steam interface tells me I've played on the Witcher 1 computer game, a classic RPG uh, from the early 2000s. I'm not going to say how many yes. hours. But I, but I wouldn't pathologise it. So oh, well, um, that's a relief. <laughs> children are more impressionable than adults. So if our generation are being affected by negative social media, uh, yeah, that's it's scary. What will happen to the kids later on? Yeah, so impressionability is a really, a really good point. Lots of, lots of adults, but not all, by the time they get to their mid twenties or thirties, um, will be quite secure in their, um, in their own personality and how they fit within social groups. That's a generalisation. Much less so for young people. Um, I'll skip to the ne to the next slide, but thank you for your contributions down the uh, side. And I guess you, you know, um, like what Izzy is saying there, you know, you might be directed towards particular content. Uh, Hannah's emphasising that there's limitless access, and I guess you might say, hold on, why are we as you know clinical psychiatrists interested in all of this? What what's that got to do with us? We just see patients in clinic or on the wards. But I guess the thing is, any healthcare professional you know, you'll be interested in the broader effects on your patient's health. Um, and that's why, you know, in different ways we might seek to intervene in teaching curriculums, or it might be that we join a particular group in our Royal College and they might um, advocate, or it might be that we vote for particular parties. I mean, I think to try and um, you know, combat stigma and address other issues in society that are having effects on our patients. So, so what we're going to try and... Psychiatry is very, very political, I would say. Can you see, can you see the um, YouTube, Tom? So I can. Okay. Um, and I think we should try and play it. It's about five minutes yeah. and it's um, a sort of non-medical take uh, by a person who experienced depression and then um, basically wrote a book and illustrated it to explain his experiences. And it kind of tells you a lot better than I could yeah. or a diagnostic manual could on what it's like to have. So we'll try and play it. And could you, could you hear the, vo the volume when I played it, Tom? Can you hear it? Uh, yeah. Not yet. So it sounds like the volume is, it looks uh -huh. like it's very low. No, it was so that was that was playing quite loudly my end. Um, so um, then I think there's probably um, a way. Sorry, everyone, a way where Rory, you can um, on one of your settings. Um, I'm, I'm just going to put it in the chat instead, and I suggest yeah, okay. um, that we we stop talking and yep. people use that link now and uh, watch it. Yeah, so if people separately go and just watch that, it'll take about four five minutes so at 10:55 we'll um we'll come back okay cool yours is continuing to play rory but
So hopefully everyone's is coming sort of to an end there and we would welcome people to put any thoughts in the in the chat about it. Um, what what I was particularly thinking is how much um, I love psychiatry because in a you know in a teaching session in order to, to get an idea across we're not showing thousands of slides about um, physiological processes and that kind of thing. We're showing you a cartoon with some evocative music um, and uh, something that that hopefully leaves you with lots of thoughts rather than, um, you know, answers. This isn't factual per se, this is experiential. And um, I think that that's, uh, that's really vital to get across about, about psychiatry. Um, people have probably come across it before, that um, particular video. The other thing I wanted to say as well was, um, we didn't talk at the beginning of the lecture about the sort of triggering nature of this kind of thing. And, I'm all for um, letting people know about the support that, that's that, that's out there, but undoubtedly we have 163 people on this call, mm -hmm. um, and and then there will actually be several of you who probably have a depressive illness, um, at, or who are self-medicating with alcohol and that sort of thing. So it is an opportunity now to say um, that there are supports out there, but also to demonstrate, you know, how common these difficulties can be. Mm. And I mean, it's a very moving video, I think, um, because it, again, points to how important it is to take an approach that um, is supporting people to access the right kind of help for themselves. Um, but anyway, perhaps let's move on to the other slides. Um, uh, but if people do have responses, we'll continue to pick them up in the chat. Um, so. I guess we also just wanted to emphasise um, the, the breadth and scale of um, the problem. So uh, when people do economic analyses of um, how much different kinds of problems contribute to ill health, it's called the untreated mental disorders, not just them in their own right, account for 13% of the total global burden of disease. So that's including things like, you know, malaria and whatever it might be. Um, and when one has a severe mental illness, which might be, you know, difficult to treat schizophrenia or more complex personality disorders um, associated with the highest rates of unemployment. And although Rory and I will tear our hair out from time to time with what we perceive as the lack of resources for mental health, um, what we know is that actually we're incredibly lucky here. There might be some countries where the average sort of ratio of psychiatrists to patients is one to 200,000. Um, uh, so globally, there's a lot of work to be done, both in terms of formal services and more broad recognition of ways that people can be helped. Um, and I guess, you know, there are specific disadvantaged groups. Um, for example, if you were to um, look at a cohort of homeless people, 50% um, of them, at least, I would say, it's probably much higher than that, um, will have rate, um, a significant mental illness. Um, and that's often alongside and not merely caused by substance misuse problems. And again, if you went to the prison, um, you would find that, again, about a third will have um, mental health problems. So what does that say about a society? Um, uh, that that's our response. Um, so a huge, just go to... a, I would add to that, Tom, a huge mm. proportion of the prison population um, have um, undiagnosed ADHD. Mm. And uh, one of the things that I obviously see quite a lot of as, in, as a child psychiatrist um, is, is ADHD. And I think that that is a great shame that um, people's behavioural difficulties, which may be as a result of a neurodevelopmental disorder, um, be, untreated become more conduct like in nature and then of course it's it's right to put people in prison if they have um, behaved in an illegal fashion however i think that's that's really terribly sad and the other thing i was going to give as an example i went just pre-pandemic to a conference in in um, san diego which was lovely a psychiatric conference wonderful city to wander around a very um affluent city and yet I had that experience of being in America, which some of you may have had, the vast number of people um, sleeping on the streets who were clearly psychotic, uh, you know, with huge um, truckloads of garbage, uh, shouting at the night sky, 
um, just completely dishevelled. And I came back to the UK very grateful for the NHS because I thought you don't actually see that in the UK, even in big metropolitan cities like London, you don't tend to see people that you just think, my goodness, they're mentally ill. So that's worth thinking about as well. Um, and so thinking, uh, sorry, Roy. Uh, go, no, go from your side, go. Yeah, so again, just thinking about the impact um, on patients, we know that those who have um, diagnosis of major mental illness, again, severe complex personality disorder, things like um, bipolar, there are lifetime completed suicide rates of around 10%. I and mean, if you have um, comorbidity, so substance misuse in there as well, um, it's even higher. So these, and you know, events like suicide are hugely traumatic for um, the people left behind as well. So, if, um, you know, we never think about the distress and dysfunction as purely as residing in that individual. Um, uh, what we also recognise, and it is worth emphasising, that if you have diagnoses or those kinds of conditions, there have been times in human history, and of course, which are still going on, where that has led to huge deprivations um, and abuses. Um, and that might be even in recent UK history in the Winterbourne Hospital, where people with severe dementia were um, sort of tortured by their so-called carers um, and other ones that have been under the guise of medical treatment, the insulin comas of the past or the rogue um, uh, surgeon Walter Freeman who conducted thousands of lobotomies on people with his travelling clinic. Um, and again, it's whenever someone has less voice and is judged as other by society, they're much more vulnerable to abuse by, you know, by all aspects of um, uh, nefarious influences. Um, so one thing that I thought might be worth thinking about in the chat um, is we know that people with mental disorders have higher mortality rates, even when you factor statistically suicide out of the equation. And it might be good to hear um, what your thoughts are for that. Why is that? Um, and they're really substantial statistics. So, um, you know, if you have something like schizophrenia, um, you are likely to have 10 or 15 less years of life. And that's not just about suicide. So already we've got some um, uh, thoughts. Yusuf thinking more likely to smoke and drink. Absolutely. And also much less likely to be offered for example, smoking cessation and smoking cessation being probably the most cost effective intervention that exists in modern societies. Um, self neglect, absolutely. And that can be everything from, um, uh, you know, really, really bad personal hygiene. I've seen people with profound mental illness getting admitted with terrible ulcers. Um, Harriet's mentioned reduced accessibility to healthcare, absolutely for all kinds of reasons. Um, uh, self medicating, like was emphasized in the video. Yeah, you might turn to things like benzos. Um, and often, unfortunately, medical professionals are part of that. In not sufficiently understanding, say, chronic pain, we might too easily reach for opiate prescriptions and gabapentin prescriptions and not think about psychological interventions. Um, Great uh, answer here, Tom, include it. I mean, uh, people are saying absolutely the right things. Alex, yeah. Alex, I don't know if Alex wants to speak to this, but vagus nerve association is really interesting. Um, Alex, do you want to turn on your um, uh, microphone and say what you mean by that? If you have a microphone and are able and willing. Um, yeah, sure. I I'm, don't know all that much about it, but it's a very interesting area where um, your vagus nerve in the brain runs by areas uh, obviously associated with very strong emotion. So there's an idea where people um, you hear about people sort of dying of heartbreak and the idea is that sort of extremes of emotion, especially sadness and grief, can actually affect how your vagus nerve, um, which we know is, you know, hugely important for basically everything. Um, so You're absolutely right. And that's, um, yeah, you've named it there. The, the, the term vagus comes from, from meaning wandering. 
And if you ever see a map just to the vagus nerve, you're like, well, that goes pretty much everywhere. It goes to my gut, it goes to my heart, it goes through um, my, my thymus, and there's associations between autoimmune conditions and depression. And that's really interesting because if the vagus nerve um, is, is overstimulating uh, our autoantibodies, for example, there's an association there. Um, and it's great that people are pointing out that basically if you go to A&E with chest pain and you have a diagnosis of chronic schizophrenia and you're behaving a bit strangely, are you more likely to be dismissed um, or not thought about in quite the same way? And that is true. And that is stigma um, as well as all, as all the rest, really. So and, these are great answers. And unfortunately, we, we continue to see that. Now, ED is a hugely pressured, stressed environment, but one of our roles sometimes in liaison is um, to advocate for patients and to make sure that they have had those blood tests and sometimes it's just to you know make sure that optimal care is given but sometimes it can happen the other way so um just to take a, a, a quick example um we had a patient who was very well known to the service um with previous uh, detentions under the mental health act and admissions and she had started to present as very aggressive, which is, of course, the thing that can highlight a relapse of mental illness. Um, uh, but her. Oh, someone, someone uh, else Hugo, is, have you ever heard of chaos theory? Oh, someone's asking if we've heard about chaos theory. Um, so I'll just pause that and finish my um, self congratulatory anecdote. Um, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, the husband of this individual emphasized how her behavior was different from normal and she was admitted under the act to a psychiatric hospital where people knew her from before and again although they saw that she was having difficulties with aggressiveness they thought something wasn't quite right and so they called the doctor and the doctor thought hold on something's not quite right here they did some blood tests and within four hours she was admitted to AMU and then within another hour admitted to ITU with a, um, a sort of crashing um, uh, acidosis. And what was found was that she had had an incredibly rare, but now increasingly recognized reaction to one of the newer diabetes drugs and had um, uh, a euglycemic um, uh, sort of DKA-like situation, um, which, the recognition had all come out of people not taking things at face value and being consistently curious um, and aware that people have physical and mental health going on. Um, so, you know, it's not just bad, and that's one of the roles that we helpfully and satisfyingly can play in mental health to think about the broad um, conditions that people are subject to. Um, yeah, someone did mention chaos theory. Um, I don't know what that refers to, butterfly effects and etc. If perhaps someone did have a question there, they could type it in the chat and we'll um, uh, come on to it. But perhaps Rory, I'll hand over to you and you can um, yeah. speak to these slides. Thanks, Tom. Um, so hopefully everyone's heard about the idea of parity of esteem, which um, really has only been in the public consciousness for the last perhaps five years. So, so maybe um, if you guys have only recently come from, you know, A levels and so on, this has always been around in your thinking. Um, but the idea is we must treat mental and physical health on the equal footing and invest sufficiently in both. Um, because actually it's a false economy not to give money to mental health services, um, because as we've said, those with mental health problems present with physical health problems. Um, and we can do lots of good preventative medicine in mental health. Um, the other idea that more commonly that I would talk about is uh, about a parity of age, actually. So we, if we look at um, the idea of liaison psychiatry, so both Tom and I do that, been a big drive to invest in um, liaison psychiatry for adults. And actually the kids bit is lagging behind. So I can tell you that there are paediatric clinics full of children with what we might call medically unexplained symptoms. Um, whose actual primary problems are their um, undiagnosed autism or their, um, their psychological disorder, their anxiety disorder, which is being expressed and manifest in their, in their bodily conditions. So we also need to think about where we're investing our money. 
And I would argue that the earlier you invest it in the life cycle, the better you get um, the outcomes you'll get. So next, this is another kind of why choose psychiatry. You'll find as you're going into your clinical years that there are certain things that, that interest you. And maybe you think, gosh, I'd love to do some of this interventional work. Uh, you know, be a radiologist who puts a, a wire in and zaps a, a, some bleeding or something like that from a tumour. All well and good if that's if that's your thing. Um, but one of the things about psychiatry is that really, yes, we're interested in schizophrenia. Goodness me, it can be uh, an amazing thing to, to think about philosophically as well as as well as clinically. But primarily, it's it's the people with the disorders that we're interested in. And actually, yes, we have the clinical expertise, but we look to the families, just as Tom said in that excellent example, and that, that family were the expert in their family member. So we privilege um, the ideas about um, autonomy very highly and about the lived experience of illness um, because that's very, very important. You'll be familiar with, um, with Descartes, a, a philosopher from a long, long time ago. And, and Descartes said that the body and the mind were actually um, separate beasts, but we know that that's, that's not true. We need to look at the language that we use that might be different. So when you come to do your psychiatry placements, you might find that rather than diagnosis, we talk about a formulation. And a formulation uh, means basically a generation of a, a story of understanding of how patient X is presenting with Y problem. What are the multiple factors which have predisposed them to this, uh, precipitated the problem, what's perpetuating it, and what is protective? So the idea of a 4P model, if you have Sorry, I think you're muted. Rory, can, uh, yeah, yeah, you're on. Um, oh, no. How long yeah. was I? How long was I talking muted? Ab about 20 seconds, Rory. <laughs> OK, I don't know how I did that. Sorry. That, that's OK. Um, OK, you, you were getting so excited. I think you must have been hitting random keys because it's so you're so passionate. <laughs> Hopefully. OK, so hopefully you can hear me now. And just returning to this idea that, that the mind and body, um, Descartes was wrong, basically. The mind and body are 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 matched. And I'm married to a community paediatrician. I'm a child psychiatrist. We actually see very similar conditions a lot of the time. And working together across body and mind, as we do in liaison, is um, is the way forward. And actually, if you're interested in this as kind of health policy, um, in Devon now we have an integrated psychological medicine service. There is a national drive to be treating these things together. Um, and in about a year's time in Cambridge, uh, a new children's hospital is being is currently being built and it's priding itself. And the selling point is that all of its staff will be trained in physical and mental health. This is a massive step forward and it's going to be a kind of gold standard. Of, of care for the future. So I think this is a really exciting field to be in as well, because whilst we don't have um, radical new treatments really coming to light in mental health, I think that's the truth. We've been using lots of the same drugs for sort of 40 years. Um, we are doing things differently, and I think that's really good. So how do we talk about this? So Tom thought we might need to remove this slide because maybe people don't know who this is, but actually, uh, Tom, he's just got a big role in um, uh, Facebook, hasn't he? This is Nick Clegg, yeah. and and he kind of uh, moved forward these ideas about parity with STEAM. Does anyone know who this is over here? Put it in the chat if you do. Might have to come back to that one. I can now see all the comments of people saying you're you're on mute. Sorry about that. So here's Johnny. So this is from this is from a famous film, and th this was kind of the the depiction, I suppose, of mental illness. And Hollywood has actually done a big disservice to mental health. Um, yes, art for art's sake, and so on. But 
the way in which mental illness has been portrayed as something that is violent, for example, um, has been really detrimental to, to the work that we do. So a few more slides for me, and then I think we'll open it up to a much more of a conversation I hope we can have. So this is also about philosophy. And um, at medical school, I did a BSc in medical humanities, which involved philosophy, really interesting. And um, the kind of conversations me and Tom will have at work are regularly about, you know, is this body, mind or both? Uh, what is the mind? How can we best intervene with the way in which this person is thinking? Is that indeed the role of the doctor at all? Um, and actually, this is true of all of medicine, but I suppose psychiatry gets the you know particularly extreme views of, uh, of it. Um, medicine is not just a science, as you know by now in your in your second year. Um, here's a really good example of where we are making some really interesting inroads into this body mind continuum. So, it is now recognised that a decent proportion of people presenting with a first episode of psychosis, which can look like all of these things: agitation, anxiety, behavioural change. Um, uh, and psychotic phenomena, so hearing and seeing things, actually have an autoimmune attack on their brain called an encephalopathy. And actually Devon is leading the way in some of the trials on deciding which of the patients who present with psychosis we should be scanning their heads, doing lumbar punctures and sending off the tests for these autoimmune conditions. And what we're finding in a subsection of patients is that if we treat these often quite bizarre neuropsychiatric phenomena with autoimmune drugs and for some plasmapheresis, their psychosis resolves. And lots of people I think in the last few years have been thinking, wow, is this going to be the end of psychosis because it will emerge it's all autoimmune disease? Well, I can't see that happening because we know that people present with um, psychosis having lost a loved one, lost a job, taken some drugs, and that doesn't feel like an autoimmune process. But I want you to know that if you're interested in neurology and if you're interested in the mind and the brain, this is really exciting stuff that is going and on. And there are absolutely psychiatrists who, you know, will focus in an academic or clinical academic way on, on conditions like these. And um, we think currently the prevalence is about one in 20 people um, who present with uh, psychosis will have an autoimmune um, uh, encephalitis. But that's still a really large number, especially when you think that there are over a million people in the UK with schizophrenia, and that's only one form of psychosis. So we're talking about, you know, many thousands of people, um, and we're still in the very early days of characterising the different um, autoantibodies and the different phenotypes of populations that might be affected by these conditions. Um, and so you end up seeing not all that many as a regular jobbing clinician, but I certainly picked up one and her treatment was prednisolone. Um, and when she stopped the prednisolone, it came back. She had a further course of treatment and then recovered completely. Um, and this is in the years gone by. She might have um, ended up in an asylum with no treatment, getting worse and worse uh, because of a, a evolving brain condition. Um, and these are emerging discussions because in, in, in my field, looking after kids, we have seen, um, particularly with this pandemic, you know, a, a, a viral illness spreading across the world. We've seen way more kids presenting with tick disorders, some of which are functional, we believe, i.e. psychologically driven and maybe a bit sort of socially contagious. But some kids presenting with really odd behaviours, odd beliefs, stopping eating and drinking for no apparent reason. And there is a condition uh, suggested uh, called PANDAS, Paediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Streptococcus, um, which is increasingly being recognised in a very similar vein. So it may be that in years to come, when a certain number of these kids present with sudden onset psychiatric disorders, we end up giving them antibiotics. Uh, and actually some patients resolve really quickly from those. Um, I had two things just, just to add very quickly. Um, so Laura had mentioned back in relation to Jack Nicholson, the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And again, another amazing performance, um, but uh, again, notorious for um, misrepresenting, well, representing accurately the then contemporaneous use of ECT. So basically as a very sort of broad brush treatment for anyone who came into hospital and Jack Nicholson's character in One Flew Over has, if anything, an antisocial personality disorder, certainly not 
um, a treatable mental illness. Um, and that's often the image that people have of ECT, which is actually um, one of our most effective therapies. We don't truly still understand how it works. All practicing psychiatrists will have multiple clinical stories of how it has revolutionized individual patients and progression. I deliver it regularly, and yet we still don't understand really how it works. So, um, uh, and yet there are still groups out there who believe it should be banned. Um, so it's a very interesting world to practice and live in psychiatry. Um, you know, it, it raises people's bloods um, and that's often controversy. But, you know, with the knowledge of science, um, you can bring really important perspectives. Um, uh, also, Tia had said, oh, do you have any book or reading recommendations? And I think we might try and put some in at the end. But the one that came to my mind is a, a personal take on what it's like to have bipolar disorder written by a really uh, luminary in bipolar research. Um, and it's called An Unquiet Mind by Kay Redfield Jameson. But if we have any more thoughts, we'll put them in the chat at the end. Great. I could even go and get a range of books from my bedside table. Indeed. Um, my, my wife always tells me, why are you working when you're at, at home? Because she sees me reading books about mental health. But that's yeah, I do that for interest and for, and, and fun. Um, there's a particularly good one uh, by, well, there's a several by Suzanne O'Sullivan, who is a neurologist, and she writes about medically unexplained symptoms. For example, um, non-epileptic seizures. That's a whole other lecture. It's fascinating. So this is all about now you getting an early understanding that mental health is not really a single entity. And it is actually the culmination of a complex interplay of all of these these different things. And I think actually you are of a generation where this will be more intuitive to you. Um, but believe me, there was a time when medical school was way more over here. Um, this was maybe slightly disregarded and this was not attended to, I think. Um, I won't expect anyone to know this person. Actually, you'd think massive Tash Curly at the corners must be a psychiatrist. Actually, Tom used to have a moustache like mm. that until quite recently. But this is a neurologist um, called William Osler. And I just put this here because, we, you know, it's another lecture to think about how you communicate with people with mental illness. But ultimately, it's about listening and attending to um, life stories. So this is great for all of medicine. If you sit long enough for a patient, they will tell you what the problem is. We also really emphasise um, stories about, um, cent you know, centralising the patient's experience, as I've said, and a really good question to ask to any of your patients, not just the psychiatric ones, but when you're on a GP placement and you're with your patient and the GP's left the room for a few minutes, you can ask these broad questions, you know, tell me a bit about your life, what, what's important to you, what matters to you, also what's happened to you, it's an excellent question. Because we think about traumatic life experiences. Um, I particularly am focused on adverse childhood experiences, which are a massive predictor of later life psychiatric pathology. So parental separation, uh, parental mental ill health, domestic abuse, a parent who's gone to prison is a major predictor of a psychiatric disorder in later life of the child and so on. A final couple of slides and then you must give us some questions so please put some down the side. So psychiatry is really exciting. This is why I chose child mental health because this is showing the evolution of um, synaptic pruning. Uh, so there's a kind of conceived idea that as we get older we get more and more connections in our brain. It's actually the reverse we now know. So our little baby brains are, are totally full of too many synapses and we chop them down and the last bit that is chopped down and pruned is the frontal lobe, where our personality sits, where impulsivity, emotionality, um, interconnectivity with others, our social brain sits here. And actually, look, that's not, it doesn't end up, it's not finished with its cooking until 25, 30 years of age. Um, and uh, actually, I had my PDG group yesterday with, uh, with my first years and got a little bit testy with them at one point and then I thought it's all right they're still in their development right? so you all have plastic brains and that's really exciting um now we've talked about this um but this is just an example of functional abdominal pain in kids which I see an awful lot of um and how there is an interplay here between our gut and our brain 
these are my red circles to say that these are really important. I'll give you an example. If an eight year old says on a Monday morning, oh, mummy, my tummy's hurting. I don't know I can go to school. There's a range of parental responses to that all the way from, oh, my goodness, I wonder what's wrong. I'll call the GP. Uh, to completely dismissing the pain to somewhere in the middle that says, gosh, I wonder if you're a bit worried about school. Should we get you in and then see how you get on? OK, so how in our environment responds to our physical symptoms is hugely important. I think I will, I'm going to stop there because we don't need all of those um, extra case studies because we talked about quite a few. So we've asked for questions and Hannah, who's been very active um, in a really positive way on the chat, has said in areas where resources are stretched, do psychiatrists work with large groups of people to try and improve stuff en masse rather than being able to see patients on a one to one basis? Is there a way this approach would help those with conditions such as ADHD or schizophrenia? Hmm. Well, um, certainly, you know, for example, if you think that alcohol is very often bad for mental health, um, either as a primary condition or as, you know, people medicating, um, you might look to, for example, minimal pricing um, policies such as Scotland are experimenting with. And I think they're always where we look to public health interventions because they were the ones who started um, uh, uh, preventing smoking in enclosed public spaces. Um, and I guess, you know, that's of interest to us. I'm interested in, um, you know, minimum pricing because we see the effects of um, uh, it. I think, you, you know, it's as a psychiatrist and, you know, whatever career you end up in, you get to choose where you put your energies. Is it with the people you see? Do you seek to um, shape your local service? Do you seek to advocate or intervene at a national level? Um, you know, they're all kind of um, options you can do. Tia has said a second year students are, oh, and look, Rory and I sometimes think completely alike. Um, and um, yeah, you can become student associate of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Uh, there is a psych sock at the rd &E who keep inviting me to come and speak to them and I keep not being able to. Um, at least I've had a good excuse recently with my 17 week year old son, Robin, um, but otherwise my excuses are poor, uh, but they run um, sort of talks and stuff. And, you know, because the uni have listened to um, Rory and I badgering on for ages, there are more psych placements. You know, there are ones in years three, four um, and five. Um, so we look forward to seeing you in those and stimulating your interest further. Um, now, I'm just going to scroll up on the chat with there some other things. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Sometimes we'll be involved in larger scale interventions, so suicide prevention um, schemes. Um, and like every aspect of health, you cannot just see it, or I would say you can't see it individually just with the patient in front of you. You think you need to think about broader policy, so social things going on. Otherwise, you're just limiting what you can do. Um, uh, da, da, da. There's a there's a question here about how Ooh. to um, how to deal with with troubling cases. Um, whilst I'm just posting links to my website. It's not self-promotion, but on, on this website, I've put a whole section for medical students, which has got lots of learning resources, lots of videos about how to take mental health histories, all that kind of stuff. The question is, how do you um, deal with emotional troubling cases? So one of the greatest thing about training in psychiatry, we do lots of reflective practice. If you are um, a core trainee, a higher trainee in psychiatry, you meet with your supervisor every week for an hour. That is unique within medicine. You talk through cases uh, and you talk about how you've managed it, not practically, not just practically, um, but also how you've managed it emotionally. And there is something called balanced groups where groups of trainees come together and, and work through as a process what has gone on um, um, and in sessions and been difficult. But it's really important to have a life outside of work. Tom's mentioned his guitar. Um, I do uh, mid-century furniture restoration. You've got to have um, a life and you've got to recognise um, what's important to you. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'd say that, you know, the, the nice thing or thing I like about being a psychiatrist is I work in very multidisciplinary teams. So for our broad team, we run supportive um, reflective sessions. And, you know, my position is that um, that door behind me currently has an in-supervision session, so don't come in, um, and it's often up. 
but I'm as interested in someone coming in to say, oh, we don't know what management or what drug we might use for this person, as the person who says, oh, I'm so frustrated with this person. What should I be doing? Or I'm angry or I'm recognising that I'm thinking about them when I leave work. That is as interesting to us. And we have theories and ways of thinking about that stuff to help make us sure that we're functioning well and, and you know, functioning happily. Um, so supervision, um, openness, particular theories that we bring to bear on managing um, emotion and challenging. And a lot of what we do in liaison is supporting our d &E staff to do that stuff too. And it makes for a very interesting job. Brett, um, cool. past, we could probably talk for hours more, but um, I think these guys have hopefully got what we wanted them to get out of it. Um, I hope they'll all go away and have a have a think about what we presented. And um, we just wanted to say good luck and thanks for listening, I suppose. Yeah, so we'll stay on the chat maybe for a little bit if there are any other things to um, pick up. But uh, thanks for coming. Um, and yeah, good luck with your careers. And and Tom, yes, um, stay on the chat. We um, I think we're going to signpost people to some support resources. Um, and there was going to be someone from student support on on the line. Um, but if anyone has any particular um, aspects that they wanted to talk about in confidence, we would recommend going through your new normal student support um, routes. Lots of people saying thank you, so that's lovely. Mm.